Hello, my name is Tom Kyle. Um, that's C A H I L L. My email address is T zero, not an O. So that's T zero M Carhill. That's C A H I L L at hotmail dot com. And my Skype name is the same, but without at hotmail dot com. So that's T zero M C A H I L L. Um, if you've got any information you'd like to share or any questions, then please please put them put them through to me. Don't hesitate. I'll, I'll get back to you at some stage. Um, I'm making these videos because I was a victim, and there's a caveat to that, of the Aston Lloyd Ponzi scheme, which I'll from henceforth call Alpons, you know, for, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Now, the reason I'm going to refer to it is that, obviously, it's an abbreviation, but you've got to understand that um, with big frauds, you've got lots of different parties involved. Some of them might seem di disparate, like they seem totally um, innocent, and they've got nothing to do, they're just fill fulfilling a function then, but later on, you start realizing that the um, the pendulum starts tipping very much from um, somebody who's just providing a service innocently and not knowing anything about it or slightly being slightly reckless and not doing their due diligence. You start realizing that these parties undoubtedly knew what they were doing from the start and in fact they co-opted. Some of them are co-opted along the way but most of them are co-opted I believe right right back way before people suspect. Now one of the big disadvantages you have with understanding complex, oh, I use the word complex, I don't believe it's that complex, multifaceted, there's lots of different facets, not necessarily complicated. If you tile a roof, you stick lots of tiles on the roof, but it's not, I believe, complicated. I've never tiled a roof, but this, you see the thing, you've got to put all the tiles in. That doesn't mean it's complicated. It, cre it, it requires many tiles to operate a very big criminal conspiracy, um, and they all need to be there or the thing won't work. Now. The word conspiracy in England is now becoming a kind of like a dirty word because it's it's come under attack from the government because people think that it needs to have the word theory attached to the end of it. Um, a little while ago, I was speaking to a certain government government um, a subsidiary of a government agent, and it said X agency um, part of the and it was a government department, and I said to him, uh, "But you're not part of that government department; you're a subcontractor." And he said yeah 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 no no we're not it's conspiracy theory and i said well but you're a private company aren't you you're not employed by the government and he goes yeah 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 no it's not it's a conspiracy theory and i said look are you employed by the government or are you employed by a private company who subcontracts the government he said yeah that's true people keep saying it and i said well it's the case then yeah but he goes yeah but it's, it's a conspiracy theory so like george well george orwell's 1984 it turns out that if you use the word conspiracy now, it short circuits people's brains and they just think it must be bollocks, which is which is a shame. And also it's particularly unhelpful considering the fact that in law in England, conspiracy is an actual charge. So I've heard of um, a reliable source that if you charge certain criminals with conspiracy now, they start laughing at you and say, fear we, fear we, it's conspiracy theory. So this is this is this is a, a major stumbling block. The use of language is a major stumbling block um, in my quest to make sure that the criminals who try to steal money off me and have stuff, you know, this uh, the, this is this current state of affairs now if it co continues, they will have got away with it. Um, is the use of language now um, just to use other examples? Obviously, you've got the apparent war in Iraq was a blunder. Like nobody, you know, you can't take a blunder seriously. It's very carefully chosen words. The War Department's now called the Ministry of Defence. You've got these various different parallels. Um, you know, you're not allowed to um, call people certain things because it's now racist, even though it's just an abbreviation. These kind of stupid, ridiculous things that um, keep coming in and keep confusing everybody. They become a real problem. Now, getting back to the case in point, one of the things that people have got to watch out for is for instance if you've got a compartmentalized system you'll have different people doing different things for instance you have solicitors barristers accountants insolvency professionals now if I went to work as an insolvency professional and I held up a bank the police nowadays would say that I'd have to the, the owner of the bank, that it's coming close to the point where they would tell you that you had to um, complain to the official receiver or something because they're an insolvency practitioner. And the fact they've obviously done a crime, 
they'd say it's nothing to do with them. This is this is the way it's going. So everything becomes a matter of what their regulatory body thinks, as opposed to what whether it's a crime or not. So what happens is, if you've got a criminal and they get a solicitor to do something for them, the police won't question solicitor because they think that it's a matter for the solicitor's regulation authority. So if you use the bank robbery example, they rob a bank, they just say contact the solicitor's regulation authority and they go on their way. It's absolutely ridiculous, um, but this is this is the way it's going. And, and this gets worse. Um, going back to the use of language, if somebody is pretending to do an insolvency procedure, which doesn't follow any of the insolvency procedures rules, is totally bogus, based on um, statements, you know, witness statements or affidavits, or you know the witness statements in support of the application to take on an insolvency procedure, and this is all based on no law whatsoever. It's completely illegal. It's based on fraud. That isn't an insolvency procedure. So the idea that they're insolvency practitioners, they're not. They might got that qualification, or they may not in certain instances, but that is not an insolvency procedure. And let's say if they were liquidators or administrators, or they're claiming to be, they aren't. But everybody likes to call them that. And because they're calling them that, that mantra is reinforcing the illegitimacy. And that causes lots of problems. Now, so sometimes, um, as I make more of these videos, which I'm basically repeating things that I've put up on various sites, explaining how the, the whole jigsaw puzzle fits together, I might use language which might seem it's deliberately unconventional because you must not call somebody who's got his hand in your pocket robbing you an insolvency practitioner because they're not using any of the rules they're not using any of the law or the insolvency act they're just telling you that they are and then they're doing something completely different for instance if you've got um, a solicitor who's taking money for a crime and passing it on to the criminal and then the criminal saying well the solicitor said I could have it and it turns out that the solicitor knows that criminal and they've done other frauds with them in the past and they're continuing to do frauds with them. The idea that they're a solicitor and you should go to the SRA is frankly ridiculous. Now, of course, this is what the police will say you do. And they say that if you come out with this startlingly lo um, simple logic that I'm employing, they'll say that you're a know-it-all. They're trying to um, make out as though you're not to be trusted. You're a reckless fool and you should just be ignored. Now, I have it on very um, good authority before um, I embarked on the quest to get this fraud sorted, that the police would be in cahoots with the criminals and the insolvency service, sorry, the insolvency practitioners, whether they were nominated by the criminals or whether they were appointed by the courts, would get on board and the whole thing would be a stitch up. Now, I knew this from the start. But the point is, and this is where it gets very complicated, and I've had people telling me this isn't the case, and they're very, they get very panicked about it when you point out it is the case, is that... With the Aston Lloyd Ponzi scheme, it's not just the Aston Lloyd subsidiaries you need to watch. And it's not just the solicitors who did the conveyancing, or then now they deny they did the conveyancing, but they, they took money for the conveyance and then didn't do it, however that works. It's not just the accountants who passed off the fraudulent books. It's a, it's a vast array of other people. Now, predominantly, obviously the police, the police were involved. The police refused to take evidence, hide evidence, do any of that stuff. They're involved and they're up to their necks in it. You've also got, um, obviously, all the regulatory bodies. They only exist in England to give people, just basically fuck people around, depress them so they never actually get anywhere. That's the whole point of them. And they make you run down certain timescales so that by the time you actually realise they're just fucking you around and everyone around the person who's been fucked around is saying, oh, why don't you deal with this regulator or that regulator? It's all a complete con. If you're a solicitor and somebody fucked you about, or you're a, you know, a top a lawyer, you wouldn't fuck around with a regulatory body. You'd take them to court immediately. That's what you do. You wouldn't even give a warning. You might even try and get the court hearing heard with them not even being there. You make some excuse up and get some injunctions put on them and all that stuff. They never bother with regulators, so why should the public bother with them? See, it's a complete con. Um, as can be said for the IPCC, the IPCC is staffed by ex-bent police that, that's, that's who it's staffed by. The, the act that put the IPCC in place clearly says 
that they're not allowed to pass any information about the complainant to the police. Now, the way the IPCC actually works is if you phone them up or you, you have to fill in a complaint form, and on the complaint form they said we can't do anything unless you sign to say you don't mind us sharing all your personal information with the police. So the act which allowed them to be brought into being is being contradicted on their own paperwork, the very first thing which is a prerequisite for them to act on your behalf. Now, this is the, the other big misnomer. They don't act on your behalf. What they then do, they basically say to the police, there's a problem, can you deal with it? Now, on the questionnaire, it will have also asked you, have you already given them sort of a ridiculous amount of time to already get back to you? Now, why should you have to allow the police, if, if they've done something wrong, why would you give them a heads up to let them know anyway? But they basically make sure that they're allowed to share all your information and you've got to already prove that you've kind of contacted them and they've already dealt with it before. Then what they do is they hand it back to the police and say, right, what are you going to do about this? And the police go, oh, uh, nothing, we haven't done anything wrong. So the IPCC doesn't even investigate anything. Once in a blue moon, and it's not like once in a thousand cases they do, but basically even if they get what's called a review, so an appeal, so you put the initial complaint into the police, then you go to the IPCC for the, so the first IPCC complaint, then they have what's called an appeal. Now if they haven't even looked at it, this whole language again comes back to it, it's an appeal, but how can you have an appeal if they haven't even looked at it? So you've got an appeal, and then if the appeal is upheld, then they sort of look at it again. And then if they look at it again, what they do, so that's like the third time, they give it back to the police to look at again. So it's a complete con. It wastes loads of time and they make you fill in all these stupid forms. And it's basically just to annoy it, annoy you and to the point that you won't even be interested in the thing, hopefully sometime down the line. Now, you've got to remember that the IPCC are quite recent in operation. They haven't been around for that long. And the people before them hadn't been in very long. They constantly replaced these organs. And it's very important to realise these organs of state are designed not to work. And what they do is they get a backlog log of insurmountable complaints that they can never ever deal with possibly. And they do all sorts of criminality and they get a big backlog of it. And then what they do is they rebrand it and they change it all over. Now, the same thing is happening right now with the, um, the Fraud Intelligence Bureau which was part of, I believe, soccer. So if you went to action fraud, it went to the Fraud Intelligence Bureau. But surprise, surprise, it's all dealt with by the City of London Police. Now they're talking about getting rid of soccer, but not getting rid of it, but it's been taken over by the English FBI, whatever that is. So that's just more bullshit. Now, if you go into the City of London Police headquarters in Bishop, behind Bishopsgate Police Station, you'll realise it's like a posh office. You can't just walk in at the front gate deck desk. You have to sort of make an appointment and all that. Or you can, but you have to be quite bullshit to get to speak to one of them. And what happens is you realise that every single person who sends you an email from there will have a different little team underneath his name or her name. But the point is, all of these people, they're all working in the same little office. So they're, they're pretending to be in all these different teams and they're doing this and they're doing that. All these people are basically sitting across the table from each other. It's it's a complete scam to make you think lots more stuff's going on. And they'll say, that's not my department, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But you see, when they pass, they also do two, They do another thing, which is they pass the parcel of these cases around. So none of them ever deal with the same case from start to finish. So they pass it around, like to say 10 different officers over the space of three years. And each one of them, if you look at the little chasers on their emails, they're in different departments. So why would you be passing it between different departments? It's quite clearly a, a, a ruse to create a, a plausible, di plausible, plausible deniability. Now, it's not plausible because they're meant to be a corporate entity. But of course, the police don't really act like a business, even though they are a business. They don't act like a business because the way they work is they will always sort of say, oh, well, that officer tried this and he tried that and, and it all failed. And, oh, I didn't know about that evidence. And they just constantly spend the whole time just acting as though they don't know anything about anything. And give us more time, give us more time. And they give you this nonsense about being concerned about you and, oh, they hope, hope you'll be fine and all this stuff. But all of this is nonsense. So it's very important to remember the regulators are there to fuck you around. That's what you'll remember. The police, these ones who work for the City of London Ford Squad, they're not proper coppers, right? You get proper coppers, some of them are dickheads, or most of them possibly are, I don't know, maybe it's 50-50, but a lot of them are dickheads, as everyone knows, very corrupt, etc., etc. But you've got to remember that they spend their time going around dealing with people on the street all the time, they're dealing with lots of criminals, 
So if they're a little bit off with you, a lot of that's their training, a lot of them aren't very bright. You get a lot of good ones, a lot of them are very friendly, very polite, you know, um, and you know, of course at some stages it's a difficult job. Of course, when you go and deal with the City of London police, they still give you the same cut out explanation, oh, oh, it's a difficult job, it's a difficult job, but all they do is sit in an office, just like any other office worker, they hardly ever arrest anyone, they don't really do what you'd consider a policeman's job is anyway. And when you've got them coming out with absolutely ridiculous statements like fraud's complicated, um, I'm not going to go and speak to them because they work in an office, or um, I'm not even going to consider them suspects because one of them used to work for us, y you realise that they basically just giving you an excuse to never ever do anything ever. Um, and um, I think that's because that's the whole point of them. They're in the city of London to protect the criminal enterprises there. And I think anyone with any modicum of intelligence will eventually realise they've got no interest in doing anything apart from serving the banking banking uh, paternity. And I believe it's becoming incre increasingly obvious there's a there's an agenda to promote fraud in any um, thing that your normal you know, one of the 99% of people or 99.9% .9 of the people in the country would perceive as an investment. They don't want anyone investing in anything other than a bank. Now, a bank, they can switch a flick, flick a switch and all your money disappears. It seems very clear to me that all of the money they want in the bank, it doesn't matter what bank it's in, they're all owned by the same people anyway, and they can flick a switch and you can lose it all. And when you consider you, you couple this with the fact that these criminals are quite happy to orchestrate frauds totally in the open, five minutes walk from the City of London Police headquarters, you realise that with all of these things, that, that it, it, it sort of ties in with something else because you've got to look that the sort of low level Freemason minions need to be able to make some money, otherwise, they've got no buy in in the Freemasons. So, what they're doing is they're allowing the um, they're allowing the um, low-level Freemasons to get away with crime, and that way they're also scaring people out of putting any money into any enterprise which isn't like a bank. And they try to make out that anybody who puts any money into like a building that's off off plan or anything like that is just some kind of like frivolous, know-nothing idiot. And this is propagated on the TV as well. So therefore, you've got a climate of fear. So people just want to keep all their money in the bank. Of course, money in the bank with the devaluation of the currency, it never goes anywhere. So this is the thing. That's the most important thing to realise. When you analyse a, a complex crime, don't be fooled. It's not like get Bernie Madoff and then the whole thing falls down. Bernie Madoff's the last person you'd get in the chain because you get the people doing the actual crime on the ground. Then you find the people who are above them, then the people above them, and then the people above them. That's where the evidence is. The evidence is never going to be with the top person. The whole thing is designed that way. The Bernie Madoff case is very, very misleading to the out the public because they think that what the police do is they just hit the top man. What's the point of hitting the top man, taking ten years gathering the evidence? You don't want to hit the top man. You want to stop the crime happening when it's happening. You know, if you were diligently trying to protect the public interest, that's not what they're interested in doing. They're interested in promoting crime and the upwards redistribution of any money that you've ever saved to keep, you know, your average person in the um, country in abject poverty. Even though they, you know, they might have a house worth a few hundred grand. Basically, you know, they're they're, they're still it's much of a muchness. They really can't. They don't have enough time to think. You know, it costs them so much to pay the mortgage, or you know, like it costs them so much over the years to. They never really have a time to think, so they never question the powers that be, and therefore it keeps them in their little boxes, getting absolutely nowhere. And you know, when they die, you have to pay forty percent tax. So even if you earn ten million pounds, you've only got six million at the end of it. And then if you divvy that up amongst your children, you see, if you if you if you actually work out how it works, it all sort of goes back to dust unless you've got the brains and the inclination to work out ways around it, you are going to lose everything by the time you die. So you're basically just allowed to borrow it. That's that's the way it works, unless you've got, again, serious amounts of money and serious amounts of brain power or experience or insider knowledge. You're never, ever going to keep anything. Now, make no mistake about it. It might seem like it's a diver digression from this particular matter, this Ponzi scheme, but... This is part of a bigger agenda. The government 
or the powers that run this country or the banking interest, they want there to be fraud by fraud, small scale fraudsters, you know, a few million here, a few million there. They want to scare the shit out of the people in the country so they never invest in anything. Um, the whole thing is that if people invest in, in um, business enterprises, it makes them feel empowered. Um, it grows the economy and um, they don't want that. They want it, They want to fuck the economy up so they can rob everybody and they can asset strip the country like they've done in Ireland, buying off all the oil, you know, all the bent politicians up there. They've sold off all the um, the rights to the uh, access to the oil and all that. That's all been done and it would never have been able to happen if the people in Ireland hadn't already been hit with the major recession that happened because they would have been on the ball. Um, and they hit them with it after a big, 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 uh, big, trough a peak in the economy they put the big trough in the people all went into a mad panic then they just basically asset stripped the country um that's that's what that's what this is all about but anyway um i'll be more specific when i get back um, and i'll do another video about the more various aspects of the thing but it's quite expansive there's an agenda behind it so you can't do it all in a 10 minute a 10 minute section thank you